<laughs> okay, we're recording again. All right, well, this last words. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks for, for uh, joining us today for this uh, great event. I'm, I'm very excited about uh, it, um, um, our speakers, uh, and it, it's always great to, to talk with all of you and, and um, have these lively discussions about care ethics. My name is Dan Inkster. I'm a professor at the University of Houston and director of the Elizabeth D. Rockwell Center, uh, which sponsors these events. Um, our presenter today, really needs no introduction. Virginia Held, she's a leading feminist philosopher and care ethicist who's recognized for her tremendous contribution uh, to both fields. Her books include How Terrorism is Wrong, Morality and Political Violence, The Ethics of Care, Personal, Political, and Global, Feminist Morality, Transforming Culture, Society, and Politics, Rights and Goods, Justifying Social Action, and several others. Uh, she's a distinguished professor emeritus, Hunter College, City University of New York. Our commentator today, Professor Nancy Fulbro, similarly needs no introduction. She's a leading economist on issues of care, women's labor force participation, MacArthur Genius Award winner, and author uh, or editor of For Lover For Love and Money, Care Provision in the US, Russell Sage, Universal Long-Term Care in the US. Can we get there from here? Also, Russell Sage. Greed, Lust, and Gender, a history of economic ideas, valuing children. Rethinking the Economics of the Family, uh, The Invisible Heart, Economics and Family Values, and others. She's Professor Emerita at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Our format today uh, will be as follows. Professor Held will summarize her paper in 15 to 18 minutes or so, somewhere in that vicinity. Professor Fulbro will then provide a 15 minute or so commentary. Uh, and then we'll open the floor for questions and commentary. If you have a question, uh, it's best if you could just use the chat function, uh, which is right, should be at the bottom of your screen center, at least that's where it is for me. Just, uh, just open the chat and write question and send it to me. It's easiest that way because then the, the, um, uh, it's very easy for me to, to see, you know, to, add, to let you ask your questions in order. Um, you know, if you do something else, if you put up your hand or something, then, you know, I, I may see it, but it's easier, easiest if you use the chat uh, function for that. So uh, with that, let me get out of the way uh, so that you, we can uh, jump into the main event. So let me hand things over uh, to Professor Held for her paper, The Ethics of Care and Economic Activity. Can you hear me? Thank you so much, Dan, for um, asking me to speak it in this very interesting series. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Nancy, for agreeing to comment on my paper. It's so influential in the important development of feminist economics. And I greatly look forward to hearing what you will have to say. As I see it, the ethics of care is the most general and also the most specific moral theory <clears throat> by which we should be guided. But within that, it's often suitable to treat given ranges of questions with more familiar moral recommendations. For instance, I think most legal questions should be guided by Kantian moral approaches that give priority to justice and most specifically political questions should be guided by more utilitarian approaches that give priority to the general welfare. And I think the ethics of care at a higher level would recommend this. But at the most general level of society and at the most specific level of personal interaction, the ethics of care is in my view, our best source of guidance. So what would the ethics of care recommend for the ways we organize and conduct economic activity? What might a caring society economic system look like? What should we say about capitalism, socialism, and better alternatives? I try to suggest in this paper how an economy guided by care ethics and the values of care would prioritize the meeting of needs and society's needs for care how it would require sustainability and respect for the environment. <laughs> how it would... um, you used the term ram. You used the noise on the research. Virginia Hill, yeah, some, something's happening with... What's happening on your computer, Virginia? 
I'm in and out. Yeah, we did. The sound is good. Now we're hearing the radio or something. Lana Sansota comes in and out. Now I just see Helena Sensota and nobody else. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're still, okay. Yeah, that's not. We're 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 all still here. Shall I continue? Yes. Um. There, there's been a little bit of interference. I'm not sure if maybe uh your shuffling is is touching the the computer or something. But it, but the sound is better if you can, when you're you're a little closer to the screen. I think. Okay, and I, I have some papers here that maybe that I was was um, not careful about keeping away from the from the computer. Anyway, most fundamentally, what the ethics of care would suggest is that we promote social cooperation rather than individual self interest in our economic activity. Does care ethics lead us to economies we can broadly characterize as socialist in place of capitalist ones? Initially, what one might think so, since the goals and values of socialism are much closer to those of care than are the pursuit of self-interest, the maximization of profit for private investment, and gain of corporate power to which capitalism seems so firmly committed. But care ethics can be aware of the dangers and drawbacks of socialism, the oppressiveness of government, governmental bureaucracies, and the inefficiencies of collective enterprises and so on. So I think care ethics may lead to more individualistic uh, and private enterprises that would be compatible with thoroughgoing socialism. It would, the, the degree of economic inequality we have at present is totally unacceptable. But that is a separate question from the kind of economic system we should strive for. Care ethics must be wary of the parochialism it may foster as persons and as persons are caring and cooperative toward their own families and friends and neighbors and relatively indifferent towards their towards those beyond. But we're dealing in these explorations with the ethics of care, and it requires the extension of the values of care, not their limitation to particular groups. What we can probably expect for the future are mixed economies, more progressive capitalism, such as described by Joseph Stiglitz in his book on progressive capitalism, and market-oriented socialism. I should add what we can expect if we're lucky, and if democracy manages to survive the various grave threats to which it is currently being subjected. So I think we can um, expect mixed economies for the foreseeable future. And we can hope that increasingly all such economies are increasingly reflective of the values of care. Among needed developments are changes in the field of economics. I'm strictly an outsider to the field. But my impression is that some welcome changes are occurring. Feminist economists are coming to have some influence and there seems to be some recognition at least of the need for economics and economists to pay some attention to care work and its importance. But there needs to be a lot more attention within the field, I think, to the moral issues surrounding economic activity what is this activity for and how ought it to be conducted? And this sometimes seems to me to require a massive overhaul or reinvention of the field. And I have no idea how that is progressing. Economics as a field still seems almost entirely descriptive rather than prescriptive. Behavioral economics has developed to challenge rational choice assumptions, but it too, is just describing how people do behave rather than how they should. What we also badly need are the kinds of normative recommendations that we've become accustomed to in political theory with its contributions, considerations of justice and rights, and more recently, to some extent at least, of care ethics. 
we also need in economics the judgments and prescriptions for our economies that moral philosophers and those raising moral questions can develop. From a care perspective, society looks fundamentally different from the way we're used to seeing it. The birth and development of children seem to be at the center of society. The care of children and others seems to be the foundation of society and assuring that there are acceptable future members of society must be society's most important concern. Once we understand the centrality of the value of care, we can start to imagine how society should be reorganized accordingly. For instance, our economic arrangements should assure most importantly that society provides the resources needed for the appropriate growth and upbringing of children. And that the economy do so in ways that are environmentally responsible. It would also provide for the adequate health and, and other care needed by all members of society. The society's first priority would be the care and health and education of children and others. And this would require that social services and education and health care become far more central and well supported than they have been. And that their perspectives become much more influential in how we think about societies. And their Many persons could continue to pursue their own economic interests, but only within an economy structured to, first of all, meet the needs of care. Of course, care resources, of course, resources in general are limited, and how to weigh the care needs of some compared to those of others, as well as how to weigh care needs and other needs of society, such as its defense, are difficult issues. But care, but care ethics is the approach best suited to deal with such problems, I think. If we look at society from a perspective of care, we can imagine that legal and political institutions should be structured so that they first of all protect and uphold practices of care. From a point of view internal to them, legal and political institutions may well rest on the principles of a hypothetical social contract between imagined self-interested and autonomous adults. But this can only make sense after persons actually interrelated and interdependent form a society providing adequate childcare, education, social services, and healthcare. As I have come to see it, a legal system's internal priority should be justice and a political system's the general welfare but these should both be understood as existing within societies whose priority should be care. From the perspective of care, instead of imagining individuals as constantly in, engaged in the rational pursuit of their own interests, restrained only by legal norms and political mechanisms of enforcement, we can see persons in weaker and stronger caring relations Persons in society develop patterns of activity, and these patterns can be more caring and morally admirable or less so. From the time they are born, human beings are in caring relations with family members and other care providers and develop weaker but still important caring relations with fellow members of society. Potentially such relations could be extended to global society. To oversimplify, instead of imagining self-interest to govern all human interactions <clears throat> and aiming primarily at contractual relations to contain them, we could strive to enlarge caring relations so that they encompass wider and wider circles of caring human beings. A war of all against all that is modified by legal and political restraints and channeled into economic battlegrounds is certainly better than one fought with the kinds of weapons that lead to violence and death. Never, nevertheless, we could and should aim for something very different, a caring society. A caring society would surely need legal and political and economic me mechanisms, but these would be understood as limited and partial arrangements for specific purposes, not the lenses with which we should see the whole of society. I'm getting there. 
Segments of society where the values of care have been influential, if not recognized, are the educational system, healthcare and welfare practices, and the civil society necessary for political institutions to function. It can be newly understood that these should be much more influential in our social and moral theorizing than they have been. Previously, the law and our political institutions seem to have been the foundations of moralities, of justice rights, rational contracts, and the general welfare. But when we understand the centrality of care, we can rethink both society and morality. We can question the ways we have seen moral issues everywhere. Instead of imagining that we should apply the dominant moralities of justice to the newly attended domains of care, we can wonder whether we should instead expand the values of care to the wider realms of economic and social activity. Perhaps care should be the basis of a comprehensive moral approach and should be used to address even questions concerning the global issues surrounding the structures of established nation states. Interest in care ethics has continued to grow and this development follows the gradual but increasing influence earlier, earlier achieved by discussions of justice and human rights. I'm old enough to have experienced these developments. A half century ago, approaches thought to be realist were the ones that were dominant and discussions of human rights were often dismissed as moralistic wishful thinking. But the discussions continued and their influence increased. Human rights became more and more important to philosophers and legal and political theorists and activists, and the influence of considerations of justice and human rights came to be extended to actual laws and policies. And today, human rights are taken very seriously in national politics and in international affairs. I expect or imagine something comparable could happen with care ethics. And because care ethics is based on experience and experience that really is universal, it has far greater potential appeal around the glo globe than many other moral theories. Economic arrangements so far have badly failed to provide assurance of the values of care through assurance of the meeting of needs economic activity ought to contribute to better families and communities and environments. The current social democracies of Europe have high taxes and governmental provision of many needed services, such as medical care, unemployment insurance, tuition for high, higher education and so on. They have capitalist economies plus an extensive governmentally provided safety net, safety net. In the US, there's much more resistance to the levels of taxation such safety nets require and much more enthusiasm for the higher prosperity the US system provides. And it does, this needs to be acknowledged. I recently came across some figures and was surprised. GDP per person is 14% lower in Germany, 24% lower in France, and 26% lower in the UK. Of course, there are more important things than gross domestic products, but we need to be aware of this side of what we propose, as well as of the benefits of greatly expanded provisions for care and supplies. many experiments to see what works and why and what doesn't work in our economic arrangements. We should experiment with corporate structures, with requiring corporations to take account of the interests of others as well as shareholders, with guaranteed minimums of income, with workers on boards of directors, and with plans that guarantee jobs for all who seek them with various public and private programs. That's what I, at the moment, am somewhat most interested in. I need to do a lot more research, the, the plans for guaranteed jobs. We should understand how the monetized economy and the current growth paradigm lead to the devaluing of care and how they threaten the environment. We should experiment with the structuring of various kinds of enterprises 
and various kinds of work arrangements, all guided by the values of care. And especially, we should get used to evaluating economic arrangements on moral grounds and making moral recommendations for how we ought to structure and run our economies. Care ethics offers us the grounds on which to make these moral eva evaluations and these recommendations, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll now pass things over to Nancy. Virginia, it is uh, truly wonderful to meet you even just via Zoom. And your work has been a real catalyst and inspiration for me. And I completely um, agree with your main point that economics needs to be more forthright in its consideration of, of moral issues. So believe me, I'm doing my best to reinvent the discipline. It's kind of an ugly, uh, difficult task. Um, and I think a lot of it involves vocabulary uh, and, and translation. And, and so I think I'm really looking forward to this discussion as a way to kind of improve my ability to engage in that act of, of cross-disciplinary um, discussion. I would like to share my screen just because it'll make it easier for me to um, stay organized. Sure. Great. Great, thank you so much. So um, he, here's what I really, um, well, I already said I, all the things I agree with and I agree with them so passionately. Economists should take ethics and the ethic of care seriously. Uh, as you observed in your paper, we should look at the big picture, not just the care sector of the economy. Um, we need to explore the ways market norms are at odds with appropriate norms of care work. And uh, I think we need to look beyond capitalism and socialism as traditionally defined to more hybrid systems. But I do have a fundamental disagreement and I, I think it, it represents my, um, or I think it reflects my disciplinary orientation uh, and, and socialization as well. Um, because I, I think there's um, a very strong binary in, in what you have set up uh, between social cooperation and individual self-interest. Um, so you say literally, most fundamentally, a caring society would promote social cooperation rather than individual self-interest. And uh, at least, well, actually, I, I think, I, this is more than a strategic uh, ploy on my part. I actually believe this, that social cooperation serves individual self-interest and that there are a lot of ways in which we could explain and enhance and strengthen and uh, kind of burnish uh, that point in ways that could um, really contribute to the this kind of uh, cross-fertilization of economics and ethics. And I think it's, in, in terms of your vocabulary, I think what I'm saying is I want to add some consequentialist uh, ethics. I don't want to rely on it entirely. I don't want to use it as a substitute, but I think it's a very, very important complement. Um, and again, maybe this is because I feel like it's my comparative advantage as an economist to talk about the important consequences of, of cooperation. But um, it, I just wanna emphasize, it is really important to this kind of crosstalk because um, there, there are sentences in your analysis that make it sound as though uh, economic growth or economic gain shouldn't be a goal or, or is somehow conf in conflict with a care perspective. And I guess the frame I would prefer is uh, thinking about how we develop a sustainable and equitable form of economic growth. And I, th I think it's more than just a nomenclatural uh, issue, you know, to, to realize the goal that you set forth, which is to provide the resources uh, 
necessary for the development of human capabilities, particularly the next generation. We need, we need that sustainable and equitable economic growth in order to do that. Um, so I think the really big question is, uh, that, and I, I can't answer it and probably no one here can really answer it, but I think we should all be trying harder to answer it is, how do we, how do we promote social cooperation? How do we promote sharing? How do we promote um, an ethic of care? And I agree that one way that we can do that is to try to change norms and preferences directly through moral discourse. So I see the ethic of care as, as really um, kind of the embodiment of that, for, of that priority um, to, to sort of, uh, you know, um, re reconsider, reconfigure the way that we think about ourselves and what we should do uh, with that moral vocabulary. But I also think that cooperation uh, requires skill uh, and it's not necessarily something that comes naturally or that uh, always existed in pre-capitalist societies or would naturally emerge in post-capitalist societies. I think actually uh, collective decision-making and efficient democracy really require some pretty detailed institutional designs that we haven't really mastered yet and that we don't fully understand. And I wanna, um, I think that's a really important um, precondition for moving forward. But I also think um, that in order to really understand cooperation, we need to understand conflict. And I think a lot of the paradigms of social conflict um, are really uh, kind of underdeveloped in, in the care ethic uh, literature. I think there's a little bit of a tendency to romanticize care as something that's uh, natural, um, that's embedded in, in our very selves. And I think it is, but I think conflict uh, and violence, the dark side of the force is also there. And so I, again, maybe this is my, my standpoint as an economist speaking, an economist who's tried to think about collective conflict and exploitation and inequality and in the broadest possible terms. So this brings me to a, a question um, that I wanna throw out and maybe it's an outline of a larger argument. Is that I think talking about capitalism and socialism is a little bit um, confining. I think those constructs, and let me just clarify, I do think capitalist institutions are really important and social institutions are really important. I don't like the idea that they, these are the two systems, you know, kind of writ large that are contending kind of like, you know, Godzilla and um, King Kong. Uh, the, the way these concepts are defined is itself a relic of this kind of productivist bias about capital accumulation that really ignores uh, a lot of aspects of, of care provision, including unpaid work. And this is why I think the feminist research agenda on patriarchal institutions is really important and why it's extension to a kind of intersectional analysis of racist institutions, nationalist institutions, more complex systems is really, uh, is really, really important. And that the ethic of care really needs to connect uh, discussions of the care ethic could benefit by connecting more explicitly with this kind of intersectional political economy project. So um, I'm, I'm gonna pretty much wind up here and hope that we can flesh these issues out in the, in the discussion. But I, I guess I, I would just summarize my recent thinking as follows. I think that history, global history, reveals a lot of collective conflict over the distribution of the costs of care. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, cooperation, uh, but there's also a lot of institutional maneuvering over, you know, through marriage law and inheritance law and property rights and rules and restrictions over who's gonna actually pay the costs and who's gonna reap the, the benefits. And I think the historical record also really shows some very systematic efforts to renegotiate aspects of what I would call a social contract or uh, some feminists 
social scientists like Denise Candiotti refer to it as the quote unquote patriarchal bargain. And what this implies, of course, is that I think the contract metaphor is useful, um, but I wanna qualify that. I think it's, it's useful when and if it acknowledges unequal power and it also when it acknowledges the special difficulties of contracting for care. And ultimately this is the way that I try to sell ethics to economists. Um, and I'm using that verb advisedly, um, is I try to argue that there are some things that can't be contracted for because agents are not present. They don't have sovereignty. They can't necessarily anticipate. And that's why societies really need a priori obligations, i.e. ethics. Um, why those are so necessary, why we can't dispense with those is that it's precisely because contracts are limited that we need to, in a sense, contract with moral philosophers to help us figure out uh, a better ethical perspective. So there you go. Can I very briefly briefly express my appreciation for those comments? Yeah. And um, um, yes, I agree that uh, sometimes social cooperation serves individual self-interest, but I'm talking about all the times when there does seem to be a conflict um, and um, how to make it. And, and I guess I, I'm talking about how to arrange things so that um, it's more often the case that the social cooperation serves individual self-interest. Uh, for instance, the, meet, it, the meeting of needs is in everybody's interest, um, but um, bringing that about um, costs, costs people various, um, in various ways, and there's a lot of conflict about that. Um, I look forward very much to reading your book, which I am not up on. And um, thank you very much for your comments. And I'll think about a lot of what you said um, uh, further as I, as I think more about these issues. Look, let me just respond very, very briefly because I, I, I hear what you're saying about the tension between individual self-interests. And I think that's, also related to what I'm reaching for and talking about collective conflict. But I guess I look at, I look at these issues partly from a more empirical or ecological perspective. And I think one of the reasons the care ethic is so powerful today is that we're basically facing two practical problems, climate change and global pandemics that really do absolutely require cooperation where we are literally doomed if we don't learn to cooperate better. And I think that's a sort of a significant change in the calculus of tension between um, conflict and cooperation that I'm trying to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to take advantage of that as a particular historical juncture, as it were. Very powerful point. All right, uh, thank you. Um, thank you both. Sorry, I, I'm having some uh, some terrible troubles with uh, Zoom, my Zoom right now. I, um, I, uh, I, I can't see the chat. I couldn't unmute for a little while. So um, perhaps we should just proceed by hand raising for questions. Can you guys see me? Can you hear me? I can okay. see you. I can see you and hear you, and I can see the chat. I'm happy to read out the chat. Okay. Yeah. If you could, if you could call the people, uh, you know, in the chat in the order. Yeah. My my chat is completely. Um, I don't know what's going on. Disabled. Oh. Okay. So I'm seeing a, a question from Tim Madigan. Um, Tim, do you want to do you want to ask that, or do you want me to read it out? Uh, well, yeah. Actually, my question corresponded to just what your closing remarks were. I just read this book by. The economist Adam Tooze shut down how COVID shook the world's economy. And he talks about the neoliberal model of maximum efficiency and how that has broken down in the crisis and how, as you just pointed out, the upcoming climate change issues are likely to 
uh, exacerbate this. So I'm just wondering how an ethics of care might offer an alternative in uh, dealing with these crises, which are not going to be going away, as you pointed out. Yeah. Well, um, Virginia, do you want to respond to that or shall I? I what's your... You, you go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I've taken a look at Tuz's book and I think I, I basically agree with what he's saying. I, I guess I think the neoliberal model is very much based on market, market measures, the market economy. And what the care, what the care ethic points to are things that are beyond the market, outside the market, just like our climate and our, our natural environment is outside the market. That's what those two things have in common. They are absolutely indispensable to the functioning of the market economy, but they are unpriced. They are not exchanged on a per unit uh, basis. So I see the ethics of care as an ethics that could, in conjunction with the ethics of climate change, really, um, really, uh, really bring the neoliberal model down. In fact, I think that's what's happening. Um, I think it's beginning to crumble under the weight of these really major global problems. Did you want? Did you want to add anything to that, Virginia, or shall I go on to the next question? And what's your preference? Uh, 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 I, I, um, I'm very interested in your estimates of the sort of um, liberal individualistic model of thinking about things has taken that much of a hit and is crumbling because I, I. Um, you don't see it. Well, I mean, I'm not looking <laughs> at the same. The same. Um, things that you are, and I think it easily, you could easily be right, but I, I haven't seen this, the kind of evidence among um, well, theoretical uh, discussions. That I'll give you my own little empirical, it's, it's my own little empirical evidence, and I think you'll like it because it's basically a generational argument. Uh -huh. It's because the younger generation of economists that, that is under 30 uh, is very, very different from the economists of my generation. Okay, they're that's asking that's different good. questions. Uh, they are uh, they're 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 very um, they're very disrespectful of the traditional paradigm, although often in kind of superficially polite ways. But I see that's where my optimism comes from: is uh, see, seeing the, the a, a kind of paradigm that's no longer literally no longer reproducing itself because of the defection of younger of a younger generation. Well, that's really interesting and encouraging. I'm, I'm very interested in hearing that. Yeah. Okay, here, here's a question from Anne, Anne Ferguson. Anne, do you wanna ask, just ask it or shall I read it out? Yeah, um, so um, I'm just interested in um, how we're framing this discourse. I mean, I, I understand that Virginia and Nancy are talking about intervening uh, in the current uh, field of economics and how it's taught and how it's understood um, with, uh, you know, some uh, the moral uh, ethics of care approach. Um, but I'm, you know, I, I'm kind of uh, struggling with this question of how what Virginia is really doing is different from something like a political manifesto. And I, I haven't really uh, finished this book. I'm just reading this book, The, the Caring uh, Manifesto uh, by the Caring Collective, including Lynn Siegel, uh, which just came out from Verso. And of course, political manifestos are different from the debate uh, you know, uh, in moral philosophy between the ethics of care and the ethics of justice. They're really trying to develop metaphors and develop ways to um, create um, a, a public and uh, a, a sense of uh, a demands that um, can attract constituencies to uh, challenge political power. So, um, so how they're framed and how they're argued is somewhat different. Um, and I'm just uh, wondering about uh, who we're arguing, arguing to. Are we arguing to economics to change their teaching? Are we arguing that uh, politicians, you know, and, and those who challenge our, our economic political order ought to have different 
um, concepts, I mean, and frameworks that involve ethical and normative values that aren't there um, before. For example, in this Caring Manifesto, they talk about caring kinships and trying to think, think in, a, you know, in ways somewhat more like indigenous people do about kinships uh, with uh, others that go past the family and so forth to develop that kind of caring uh, understanding or connection to others that is missing when you just have market logics, uh, you know, going on and so on. So, I don't know if my question is is really well formed uh, because I'm I'm just trying to figure it out myself. But maybe you guys can take something from it and answer whatever you want to. <laughs> well, I think Lynn Siegel should answer since so she's once one of the authors of the Care Manifesto. Oh, is she here? Oh, she posted something in chat. Oh, okay. Are you there, Lynn? Thank you. Um, it's lovely to see you again after about 30 years <laughs> when we were active in socialist feminism, second wave socialist feminism. And um, I think the thing to take on board at the moment as um, Nancy is responding to Virginia is that there really is a lot happening around care now. A few days ago, I was speaking at the European Parliament where social Democrat, Democrats in Europe were meeting together and their topic was, how do we bring about gender equality via a care politics? And the week before, I was talking to people in Latin America who have their own care manifesto coming out in which they're trying to... And they connect with about 100 trade unions globally. And they're also discussing how can we organize care workers in order to create greater care and greater equality globally. And then I do think that a third crucial aspect of talking about care today, as Nancy says, is green politics. It is the ecological agenda. So in Britain, we're about to have COP26, it's called, I don't know why it's called that, um, where our um, Tory government is actually going to put forward nothing at all. But uh, nevertheless, young people everywhere are blockading our bridges and streets and saying something really has to be done. And when I've talked, I'm in the British Labour Party, when I've talked in the British Labour Party saying, I don't think enough is being done about care, the old Corbynistas like John MacDonald, who used to be the um, <coughs> in charge of um, thinking about the economy as shadow economics minister in the Labour Party, said, yes, we've simply got to do more about care. And we've set up a group involving care workers in the Labour Party, care workers and their supporters to get a new agenda around care. So I think the, the single main thing for us to be very happy about is how much care has risen up the political agenda for any progressive forces, you know, any progressive left-leaning green forces. And that is a hell of a lot of young people, I think. Unfortunately, um, we're still not in control, certainly not in Britain. You, you've got actually more chance, I think, of things happening in the States with um, the uh, LEAP manifesto that you had there, which the um, those young uh, leftists like uh, Cortez in the, in the uh, Democratic Party is certainly taking up in a big way. So, you know, I do, I do think there are reasons to be confident and to spell out then just how much needs to change. So in employment, for instance, you have to have shorter time in paid work in order for there to be time for people to be able to care. Why we're suffering from such a huge care deficit now is that women and men and any non-binaries are out there working all hours in paid jobs just to keep a roof over their head often in very worthless paid jobs as well. And so seeing that, that those market um, logics are completely at odds with the care logics that are actually going to enable us to have any sort of decent future is, I think, where we begin. There's something wrong 
with imagining that market logics can deal with our caring needs, you know, when destroying the environment on the one hand, but on the other hand, from cradle to grave now, people do not have enough time to do the most essential caring work, to care for their own children or, you know, to care for their ageing and elderly parents. Here, Bev Skeggs, who's done a lot of work as a sociologist um, around care, describes it as a crisis of humanity. She says, almost everyone is going to experience the fact that they are not able to offer the essential care, you know, that those that they care about need on the one hand, but then on the other hand, if you link that, link the fact you know, of the stress that's been caused in families from cradle to grave with the gloom around climate change, then care simply has to be at the top of our, our political agenda. But also, as Anne, I think, was saying, that means rethinking how we live across all scales of life. So that is what we were trying to say in the care manifesto. We, we begin in the home where there has to be more sharing of the caring, not leaving, not leaving it to those invisible housewives who aren't there anymore. And since the invisible housewife isn't there, we have to rely on a global care chain of exploited women from elsewhere you know, who can't care for their own dependents and have become usually as incredibly insecure workers to take up the care work in richer countries. And this is something, you know, it's very much affecting us here. It's certainly affecting you there. It's, it's certainly affecting countries like um, Greece and Italy and so on, particularly in the care for the elderly, but not only the care for the elderly. So I think the crisis we're facing is overwhelming. And that's why there's so much interest, for instance, in our oh, care manifesto, which has now been translated well, into 12 languages. Right. Thank yeah, you I'll so much. You just did, that was magnificent. It was like a little mini manifesto. <laughs> uh, um, I, I just want to be sure that we can go through some of the other comments and questions. Okay. I don't know, Virginia, did you, did you want to oh, add I'm anything here? So much uh, appreciating all these comments. I'd rather yeah. hear from other okay. people. Okay, so Maxine Eichner said she had a question. Maxine. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, and, and thank you all, Virginia, uh, Nancy, Lynn, for, for a stimulating conversation. Um, I'm glad to be a part of this. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure if I'm pushing back or asking you to explain more, but I have to say I was a little surprised from both Virginia and Nancy to hear you um, uh, value growth and GDP and to- No, no, not um, GDP. GDP is not growth. Okay, okay. well, let me, let me, thank you for that clarification. Yes. Um, yeah. um, the, I mean, what economics hasn't done that I think probably everybody in this room would, would uh, well, in this virtual room would agree with, is recognize that the, the ends of the economy should be uh, our well-being, individual and, and community, and, and the environment as well. And that requires, uh, I think, a, a you know, huge rethinking um, of the goals of economics and all those things about Absolutely. growth and yeah. and everything else have to serve that end. Um, and and so I, I I'd love you both to talk about that. And you know, and and certainly when it comes to the environment, you know, most of the growth probably that we have had over the course of the last century has been because we've extracted huge amounts of fossil fuels and other things from the environment. So thinking about how to do care well um, um, in concert with these other goals, uh, I, I think requires, well, I'm asking you, I think requires a much more full scale rethinking about our, our ends than, than at least I think I've heard today. Um, the other thing I, I and Virginia, this is, and I'm sorry, Nancy, did, did that strike you as? No, 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 keep going. 
Um, the other thing that I was gonna say to you, Virginia, is, is I wonder too about um, once we start to rethink the goals of the economy, um, you know, the, the language you used about safety net even seems to me to be inadequate. The, you know, we think about the safety net as when we think about, okay, market is supposed to do most of the work in a society in getting resources to the folks who need them. And when that doesn't work, we have this kind of, uh, you know, bottom bottom stuff that which, you know, which when folks really need it, we hopefully won't let them get below. And I know that doesn't apply in the US, but that is at least, I think, a logic of the lot of the left. Um, and really, I think when we're talking about these kind of full scale rethinkings of how the economy should intersect with care, we're talking about much more than the safety net we are talking about how we organize an economy to make sure that everybody's supported. And that is not just the kind of detritus, you know, what's left, you know, after everything else failed, but that is, the, you know, the fundamental purpose of the economy. Okay, I uh, have asked my question. Let me throw it open to you all and anyone else who wants to respond. Well, I mean, I think you did a great job of, ex of outlining what's completely wrong with the way economists think about growth. And we should redefine it in ways that really emphasize the development, the, the, the production, the development, and the maintenance of human capabilities. That should be our dashboard, not gross domestic product. But um, So what is the role of growth? I mean, can you, Nancy, I assume you, more than anybody in the room, has thought about this. Um, and you've pointed to what you see as the importance of growth. What do you mean by that? And how do we balance that about against these fundamental things like well, I mean, uh, caretaking I, I've and spent, environmentalism? I've spent a lot of my career basically trying to take GDP apart and show why it's wrong. And there's no one single indicator that we can replace it with. We need a dashboard of things. We need to look at things like life expectancy, like health, like mental health, like... Uh, you know, the degradation of the environment. We, we just need a really big dashboard of goals that are, are consonant with, with what we're talking about. And the process of developing that is too important, obviously, to be left to economists. Uh, but I think we need to collaborate with economists about it. I mean, I think it's also true that there's still, you know, we have a lot of technical problems that we have to solve. We have to figure out a way to generate energy electricity and energy that's not based on fossil fuels. We need to invest in infrastructure, physical and social. We need the resources to be able to invest in a sustainable future. So we can't just say, oh, we don't need growth. We need a different kind of growth, I think. And it will be a challenge to develop the, the, you know, the conceptual and, and kind of terminological strategy for doing that. So I hope it will be an interdisciplinary process. We'll see. Uh, let's see. Jennifer, Jennifer said you had a comment about care for the earth. Jennifer Nadelsky, did you wanna chime in? Yes, thank you. So hello everyone, uh, it's so great to see you, Virginia, after so many years, and Nancy after fewer. Um, so I, I just want to put on the table as we're talking about the environment and a sustainable way of living, that in Canada, it's really become increasingly important to look to indigenous legal and political thought and ethics as a source, uh, in part because many of the dichotomies that we've talked about, socialism, capitalism, the collective versus the individual, really just don't play out in, in anything like the same way in those frameworks. Um, and there's a move to make you know, conservation movements indigenous guided. And uh, part of what, it just, it fits with this conversation. It's not, not a, a challenge in any way, but one of the ways I think about these issues of what it's gonna to take to say, get rid of fossil fuels is a completely different sense of our relationship to the earth. 
that is better cost benefit analysis of long term you know, resource extraction is not going to cut it. It's not going to give a, enough of a social motivation to the depth of the change that is necessary. And so part of what I see as necessary is a sense of responsibility to care for the earth. And yeah. that as we think about the ethics of care, that really has to always be there. And then to think about what is it that enables people to actually experience receiving care from the earth and experience not just conceptually, but actively experience a sense of mutual responsibility. Thanks for that. Uh, Annie, Annie Bartos, do you, did you wanna ask your question out loud? Sure, hi. Um, hey. Thank you so much. This was really excellent. I'm a little bit nervous now that you put me on the spot just because <laughs> you guys are famous and here we are. <laughs> My question really comes down to conflict. Um, I'm really grateful, Nancy, that you mentioned how important conflict is to understanding care and how we really need to understand that a little bit more proactively and more um, directly. I've, I couldn't agree more. And one of the things that I've been noticing in this conversation is that all three of, well, Nancy and Virginia and also Lynn, we're just kind of, we're evaluating and thinking about the role of youth today and, and just how transformative the potential is um, for young people under 30 <laughs> um, to have different ideas that could be much more challenging. And one of the things that I'm thinking a lot about is how um, that conflict between ideologies of historical kind of Im embedded ingrained thinking about how things are and how they're supposed to be and how they should be. And even the word should is used over and over and over and over and over again versus how to really truly consider and understand our interconnections because our interconnections promote are, are based in violence like i'm just even like a simple thing right now i'm thinking of like property right and people can own multiple properties and not ever really understand how that is a is promoting conflict for generations that will never even be able to own property and yet that relationship between um, that interest, that self-interest, and my relationship to being interconnected with other people that I may never ever have anything to do with by the simple fact that I'm owning more than I should. Again, bringing in that should word. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just, I'm thinking a lot about this. I'm grappling a lot about this. And I think that when we talk about young people being able to change the world and how, you know, we have to put our, our, our kind of hope in them, I think it really comes back to actually putting our hope in the older people to change because the young people don't even yeah, need yeah. to change so much. Wait, well taken, yeah. And it's 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 really yeah. how do we remind or not even remind, how do we create more of a um a fo an, a forward and an inward perspective for yeah. older people to Got you. Acknowledge their place in interconnection. Yeah, I I didn't mean to be handing it off to you, Annie, to, to take <laughs> care of all of this for us. You're right. Uh, so thank thanks a lot for that. Um, Maurice posted in the chat the URL for the Care Manifesto for Women in Latin America, Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, people might want to uh, make a note of that. Looks like really interesting. And Lynn pointed out that um, Anne Pettifor is very good on, on this. I think maybe she means on sustainable, on sustainable equitable growth, arguing for a Green New Deal. So new Verso book. Um, so that reference is in the chat. So Ga Gawain, or is it Gawain? I'm not sure if I'm saying it right uh, because our interactions have mostly been on email. <laughs> But um, uh, go, go ahead and ask. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'm I've been I'm on my bikes, so I'm not going to turn my camera on. Um, okay. Uh, so first, just to say thank you so much uh, to the organizers and uh, to um, the speakers. It's a real honor to be able to participate in this and hear these legends in 
in the realm of care, intellectual thought. So thank you very much. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about, I come out of the uh, international development sector working on policy and advocacy, and I've been thinking a lot about how to operationalize and put into policy care ethics. And um, obviously I don't have a clear vision for it, but, um, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot over the last couple of years. And I was really interested in Virginia's comment about the optimistic comment about how human rights were once laughed at and now they're taken seriously, which I think is true, um, but also a very incomplete project because a human rights as an agenda exists and has made progress, but also is a rather weak agenda, not well implemented, not well enforced internationally or really almost anywhere. So uh, it's a positive story in terms of going from nowhere to somewhere, but not a great story in terms of succeeding to uh, become the hegemonic ethical framework or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I, wanna, I just wanna um, put it out that in, in, the, in the international development sector uh, has embraced human rights as a, as, a, as a concept or as a motif rather than uh, charity, uh, which was I think a, a big transformation and an important one. Um, and I've been toying with the idea of substituting or, or adding, I should say, care ethics as an international development agenda. And then, but the question I have is, how do you layer that on to something like human rights? Do you uh, layer it over it and have them stacked up? Uh, or do you try to substitute it mm -hmm. because you see it as more productive um, or more useful? Or how, how do these different ethical approaches uh, coexist yeah. or, do, or should they coexist? Yeah. And then also, how do you not allow decision makers and policymakers to pick and choose, you know, based on their own ideas or interests between these yeah. ethical choices? So uh, just, just these are things I'm worrying about and thinking about. I'd love to have any kind of commentary on it. So Virginia, I think maybe you should respond to that, but I, I wanted to mention that Ann Ferguson had posted in the chat a related point, um, which is, is kind of a response to this question, is there really a distinction between promoting human rights and the care ethics if one includes a right to care and be cared for as part of the list? So Virginia, whatever thoughts you have on uh, well, this bigger think, issue, yeah. <clears throat> I think these are really interesting uh, issues and the way human rights has been thought of um, um, in the last, I guess, uh, sort of half century that it has developed so much has very much been in legal terms uh, and the kinds of uh, rights that have been specified um, uh, tend to be the kinds of things that, that the law can recognize and that could be um, adjudicated in some way. And it doesn't lend itself very well to a whole lot of um, care issues. In the case of something like responding to a famine, um, people can't uh, make sure that everybody is treated equally because um, they don't have the they don't have the capacity to do that. They're handing out um, desperately needed relief, and whoever comes first kind of m might get it. And whether it's whether it's being distributed in a way that's fair and just and respective, respecting of individual rights, it, it, they just don't have the ability to to think in those terms in these situations of desperation. But that's a good example of how this kind of activity of responding to um, famines and and desperate human need in in many parts of the world. Um, need to be looked at for what they can contribute to our theorizing. And yes, I entirely agree that we need the moral theory to handle all that. I mean, how many, how many um, things have you read on moral theory of responding to, to famine? It hasn't, it hasn't been something that's been part of my um, background and awareness. It just, it, 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 the, the things that have been influential in the moral theorizing have been much more legal and political. And, um, and I think we need this other kind of theorizing. I think it would be extremely 
interesting if um, th there were this influence from from um, the the areas of responding to famine and and dealing with uh, extreme need in various parts of the world. And right now, the care the care approach, the care framework would be much more able to handle that kind of thing. Um, but of course, the things should be integrated theoretically adequately at some point. But I think that's um, that's to be that's a goal. I don't know of a, a lot of work that that does that. But I think that these um, uh, issues are very interesting. And when we talk about economics, I'm encouraged um, by those who think that the field is changing because maybe my view is. Um, is um, not satisfactory. Uh, I, I still have the impression that moral issues are not taken very seriously no, I think that's in true. the field as a whole. But I'd love to hear from others and not talk anymore. So uh, Dan, I need some guidance here about the, how long you want to go. Um, yeah, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can't even tell. I don't know if I'm muted or not muted. So, so we should go until 1.30. Oh, okay. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, there's a bunch of kind of informational stuff in the chats. And then Maurice says, Hamington says he has a comment on the care ethics and rights discussion, if there is time, which there is. Great. I saw all the things in front of me, and I thought maybe we wouldn't uh, necessarily get that far. Um, by the way, just a, a wonderful discussion, and it's great to have uh, such accomplished um, um, scholars together in one place. So I appreciate this, and I appreciate Dan putting this together. Um, on that uh, that uh, you know relationship between uh, rights and uh, and care ethics, you know I, I think of um, rights as an important uh, social, political, and legal tool. Um, to getting people the care, you know, that they need. Um, and uh, certainly we need to um, advocate for advancing them and uh, establishing, and establishing them and enforcing them. But ultimately, um, a lot of rights depend upon uh, society for their fulfillment. Um, somebody could ostensibly have certain kinds of rights, right? We can say they have rights, uh, but um, if people don't follow through, those rights don't get um, actuated. And so that's where um, I think a distinction between um, an ethic of care and caring and an ethos of care is, um, uh, is important because I think, um, you need, the, you need the symbol, you need the totem, you need to have the rights, uh, and they do work, but you also need um, the spirit, people who um, you know, buy into the rights to make sure and help that they become um, enforced and enacted. Um, we have you know, witnessed all kinds of violations of rights, human rights and other uh, rights, and um, uh, and you know, um, if people were also behind them, if we can bring the community along, if there could be a general ethos of care, um, I think that those rights uh, would manifest themselves more strongly. So that was just my comment. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. Um... So Monique, Monique and Jennifer, you had comments. Did you want to speak those out? I don't know. I'll let Monique go first. OK. OK, thank you. Uh, I'll turn my camera on. OK. Um, no, I was just relaying. Um, it's the Canadian uh, Women's uh, Health, the Centers of Excellence that got together uh, back in the early 2000s to come up with uh, the declaration, um, the, care decla the care declaration. And I liked how they framed uh, the ambiguity, right? And so here they're kind of bringing in um, having the right or, or to provide care um, and I was thinking more largely 
actually their manifesto or the declaration is really sort of focused on humans, but one could enlarge it and think of the earth. But I see uh, Jennifer's point that it's true, responsibility is slightly different than the right to care. And I, I'm also uncomfortable with simply a rights framework as it is sort of limited. But anyway, it I like the idea of, yes, I have the, the right if I want to, to provide care to um, the world or my kin and so on. So uh, I'll stop there. Thanks. I, yeah, so that, <clears throat> as I put in the chat, it, it I, I find it, uh, you know, it's an old puzzle about, you know, ethics of justice, ethics for, of care. Do we need a rights-based notion of equality uh, to somehow support the ethics of care? And there were earlier arguments that, well, you take rights as your baseline, and once everybody has their rights, then you can add care on top. I think that's a completely misguided way of thinking. You, you will have a distorted understanding of rights if you try to do it that way. Um, and so I think I more and more, so one of my projects at the moment is redefining private property to build in a responsibility to care for the earth into the meaning of ownership. Um, not a restriction on ownership, but the meaning of ownership. Um, and, and that is really a responsibility based framework, which I think in most cases is what we really are gonna be wanting to do and the uh, indigenous legal framework helps with that. I'm not opposed in the short term to speaking to people who only think in terms of rights to add the right to receive and to give care. But um, I think it's a deeper challenge to figure out how we rethink responsibility as, as a core framework without completely removing any sense of the role of individual entitlement, but no longer making individual entitlement the, the core of the whole framework. Yeah, thanks for that. Joan, uh, Joan Toronto, two comments. Hi, I'm still typing and I hope I can speak before the noise starts out back again. Um, first comment, I, I wanna bring us back to the question of needs because Virginia in your paper, you um, keep saying it's important to focus on needs but the truth of the matter is the question of needs is a really important place for conflict in thinking about what care is. And we can even go back to Nancy Frazier's uh, remarkable paper about how needs discourses are mostly controlled by people in relative positions of power vis-a-vis -vis those who are relatively less well off. Now the, the needs discussion carries over into the environmental discussion. When the COP meets, the, the needs of the people who have electric clothes dryers um, will just be taken for granted that they need those things, as opposed to the needs for people whose you know, land is basically being invaded by seawater as sea levels rise. How do we weigh the relative importance of different needs? It's a really difficult political question. And it takes me back, of course, to say that there's something fundamentally political at work here. Uh, secondly, I wanna agree with Jenny Nadelsky's point about the importance of using the language and the framework of responsibility rather than the language and framework of rights as a way to move forward. Once again, it's an area of conflict, right? Which responsibilities should we have and to whom? And furthermore, they're both universal responsibilities we might have, um, Virginia, when people are starving, we try to get food to them, but there are also individual responsibilities that people in the world have been really loath to take up. The responsibility of colonial powers to their former colonies um, is a specific kind of responsibility that really should play out in our discussions of global justice, uh, but, but it's very rarely uh, framed that way. Um, last thing I want to say, I've been rereading Carolyn Merchant's The Death of Nature. I don't know if you all know this book or remember it, but she made the argument already back in 1980 and the essays were published in the 70s, that with modernity came a change in the way that Europeans thought about nature. 
that before modernity, Europeans also thought like indigenous people do, that nature was alive, that it was vital, that it was responsive to us and we could respond to it. We could make demands of it and it would sometimes meet them and sometimes not and so on. Um, I mean, she talked about the ways in which early mining, even in the Middle Ages, was opposed because it was seen as a violation of the earth. Wow, those are ideas that are in the European tradition, but which were completely closed down with the growth of modernity. And there's a way in which, as a, you know, the most mind-blowing thought I'm having lately is that as we begin to think, rethink what a relational form of ethics will look like, as opposed to one that comes out of individuality and individualism defined in the way that modernists do, starting in the 17th, 16th and 17th century, as we begin to rethink that, it will make it much easier along the lines that Jenny was just saying, for us to rethink our relationship to, na to nature, whatever that is, and to the earth. So that's it. that's it, thank you. These questions and comments have been so inspiring, thank you. Yeah, it's really been a, a really great discussion and there's still time if anybody wants to add a last word or two or three. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there's no one else in the chat. Um, yeah. I, 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 can't, I can't even raise my hand here. So, uh, or by my virtual hand, I can raise my real hand. So, um, yeah, I wanted to ask about um, Virginia and your paper. You, you, you talk, start to talk, you have a couple paragraphs about things like, um, you know, corporate social responsibility and, and um, you know, this movement that, that um, uh, of people in business to say that they're more, they're, they're about more than just profits. They, you know, they're taking care of the community or they have concerns for people's needs and things like that. And then a couple, like maybe a page later, you actually uh, cite Nancy's work and say, yeah, well, you know, that's not really going to work, um, or there, there, there are sharp limits uh, to that because of the, the structure uh, and the, the demands that a uh, capitalist system place upon uh, businesses and people in business, um, they, they won't be able to be very ethical for very long or very responsible. And a thought that was going through my head, actually, um, uh, taken from Jenny Nadelsky's uh, work on, <clears throat> on Part Time for All, uh, which a, a lot of you, <clears throat> I think, know about. But um, uh, you know, if you don't, she she's uh, arguing for uh, um, a minimal amount of care each week or each uh, what each week. Yeah, that, that people should do in a in a maximum uh, um, amount of of uh, you know kind of labor force work, and um, and she she bases this argument on a, a kind of a, a cultural normative change that takes place, right? When when I first read her work, I I, I was trying to read it as like, well, what is this going to be? Is this going to be the government enforcing this? And she, you know, and she's no, 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 no. This, you know, this is going to be a uh, a normative cultural change that has to take place where you know people are going to start saying like, hey, why are you working so much? Or hey, how come you're not doing more caring? And at first, I, I I wasn't persuaded by that, but over time, I've come to think quite a lot of it. I'm, I'm really I'm really um, um, uh, you know um, taken by it now. And and so so I guess applying all that back to your argument, Virginia, and then Nancy can can comment too if she wants. But but I I guess you know I I. I Maybe you know, perhaps, and, and I'll let someone jump, jump in and tell me just how naive this is. But, but, but it seems like, like maybe there, there might be this kind of possibility as well, right? I mean, uh, we can look to governments to try to, you know, regulate businesses, um, and businesses will always kind of sneak out of it. Or we can really push for, and we can do it through as as consumers. We can do it as investors. Um, to really push businesses to themselves become. Um, more caring, uh, you know, kind of from from the ground up and try to affect this sort of cultural normative change where uh, whether, you know, I mean, you know, we're still going to need some kind of government regulation, but, but, but ideally, you know, 50 years from now or something that might become less necessary because a company that, that just um, kind of, you know, paid no attention to, to, you know, matters of their their workers' mental health or physical health uh, would people just wouldn't stand for it. Um, I don't know. This is this is a kind of hope or thought I have, and I I 
just would like to hear what you think about that. Could I, could I um, please address that? Um, thanks a whole lot for that because um, I too wonder uh, what those uh, possibilities are. I don't want to be um, stupidly and falsely optimistic, but um, there, cultural change does occur. And with the right kind of cultural change, you could have a great deal more pressure on, on individual enterprises to be responsible. Um, and um, it, in these ways that have to do with the environment or the need for care or, or um, whatever it is that we're talking about, if, the, if, the, if it's true that young people studying economics are really gonna transform this field because they're fed up with the inadequacies of the, the way traditional economics is approaching what really matters and, and addressing these questions, um, this can spread to the wider society also. And we have seen quite a bit of cultural change in recent years. Um, and cultural pr pressure on corporations could achieve quite a bit. So um, I don't know how optimistic to be. Sometimes it's awfully hard to be optimistic when you look around at, at how even the most established kind of things like, or, or arrangements like democratic institutions are under such uh, yeah. stress these days. It's really hard to be optimistic, um, but I should think that a great deal of cultural change could occur in how we think about uh, corporations and their activities, property, um, all these things that have to do with the e economy. Um, I must say I'm a little bit disappointed that there wasn't any discussion of whether socialism is um, you know, better than capitalism significantly um, and um, what we should say about all that or what we should work towards in the way of maybe um, that kind of thing. But if we are stuck with capitalism the way we seem to be um, anyway, um, transforming uh, uh, economic enterprises might be something to um, work hard to, to um, do something about. It's a very inadequate answer, but thanks for, for, thanks for your points. There's a couple of comments in the chat that I think speak to what you were asking, Virginia, that uh, Jennifer Nadelsky comment on, on the economy of Francesco, a youth-based organization from the Catholic Church aimed at radically new ethics for business. Ann Ferguson talking about the solidarity economy, businesses and networks, cooperative movement, mutual aid, co-op businesses and volunteer work. Um, Could I and, ask a technical question? Are the, uh, are the comments that are off screen going to be in the transcript in the... Uh, uh, if this is being recorded, can I get, will I be able to um, get to see them later, the things that were uh, in the chats? Is that part of the recording? I, I hope so. I, ho I hope the recording is uh, picking up the, the feed prior to what I'm seeing. Um, Let I'm me not... just say um, on that, uh, anybody can save the chat by going to the chat and looking at the bottom and on the, on the dots. You click on that, it says more, and it says save chat. You can all individually save the chat to your own, uh, to your your own, own chat. So please, everybody do that. Please save chat. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's a really good chat. Yeah. <laughs> and and Ann Ferguson pointed out, you know, it's not just socialism versus capitalism. Market socialism is the third possibility. Um, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I, I guess I would just reiterate my point that I, I think there are many capitalisms and many socialisms and the idea that that these are just two categories is is actually kind of unnecessarily constraining the the debate but um that may be a topic for another day <laughs> so tim dalton said in the chat you can also save the transcript if you have captions enabled and does anybody have any last questions or or comments 
Can I, can I throw one last question to Virginia? Uh, it sure. goes back to Annie's sure. question, just because. Sure. Uh, uh, Annie, you started out with this question of care and violence, and Virginia, you've you've uh, you've written quite a bit about care and violence. So I just wanted to to know what see see uh, what you have to say about on that topic. That's for another time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Lynn, did you want to get a, a some words in? Well, I just uh, really wanted to say in conclusion, we all need you know, the right to care and be cared for. You know, the poor have always had to care. The rich on the whole have been able to avoid caring. And, and indeed, that's a sign of their status, not having to care and being surrounded by all sorts of flunkies who can care for them. But I also wanted us to to focus on the contradictions and complexities of caring without adequate resources, because you know, there are incredible challenges if people feel unable to care in the way in which they would like to. And, and therefore, you know, thinking about caring relationships, one has to always be thinking about communities, thinking about respite care, thinking about you know, we need people around us to be encouraging us and helping us and teaching us how to care well, because it doesn't, it actually doesn't just come naturally. One can feel resentment and, and you know, there can be actual cruelty and dominance in caring relationships. And, and that has to be recognised as we're rethinking, you know, what we do when we care. And we, you know, we, we have to have access to all sorts of different resources to be able to care well both for each other and for the environment and the world at large. That's what I wanted to add. Okay, well, uh, Nancy, thank you for jumping in and uh, um, playing host. Uh, that was great. Um, see, uh, you know, the, the community comes through and when uh, <laughs> problems arise, so that was that was wonderful. And I actually enjoyed it. I um, uh, you know, being able to to sit back a little bit more and listen to the conversation this time. So that was great. Maybe a uh, future uh, session, someone else would like to host. I'll, I'll be open to that uh, for sure. But uh, but thank you. Uh, thank you, Virginia. That was a wonderful paper. I, I, I have it here and I have all these places that I'm going to right after this. Uh, I want to pull out and, and remember for various reasons. So so that was great. Uh, great presentation, uh, Nancy. Thank you so much for, for the great discussion. Yeah, it was yeah. really good. Nancy, thank you for your comments and for being the host. And uh, thank everyone for being here and uh, yeah, for that discussion. And uh, this is a this is kind of a, you know, it, it, they happen every month or two months and, and I always look forward to them and they never disappoint. So so thank you all for, for this. So uh, have, a, have a great weekend, everyone, and uh, we'll see you, I hope, on, it's Wednesday, October 27th, as Ilana uh, Bush is going to be presenting, and then on November uh, 19th, uh, Maurice Hamilton and friends, I think, are going to be presenting, yeah, so uh, so two more sessions this, uh, this semester, and then we'll pick up in January with Carol Gilligan, and um, I'm hoping we'll sort of just have her talk about, you know, uh, from her work to, uh, to, you know, what has happened with care ethics and, and, uh, you know, general discussion about that. So, so, uh, and then, for a great discussion. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.